Hallo everybody, hallo zusammen. Wir sind heute hier in der Schweiz, in St. Gallen, im wunderschönen St. Gallen. Ich zeige das einmal ganz kurz gleich, damit man weiß, wo wir sind. Das ist sozusagen die Landschaft und wir schauen auf die Stadt hinunter, die sich hier unten anfügt an den Hügel, auf dem die Universität St. Gallen ist. Und hier findet heute das große St. Gallen Student Symposium statt, das von Studentinnen und Studenten ganz alleine und sehr professionell organisiert wird, seit vielen Jahren schon und wirklich hochrangige Gäste mit sich bringt. Und wir werden eine Diskussion haben, die heute ein bisschen auf Deutsch und auf Englisch ist, weil wir nämlich einen Gast bei uns haben. Yes, that's right. We have our very first guest, unser erster Gast. And I'm very happy to introduce to you Professor Michael Kosinski. He's an assistant professor at Stanford University, at the Business School of Stanford. And um, a few of you might have heard of Michael Kosinski before, because there was an article at the end of last year that, uh, let's say, gave him a little bit of a boost in terms of his research because it ended up being the most discussed German article of 2016. Michael, what happened? What was the article about? And uh, what exactly in your research was it that had people talking about it so much? Well, so I'm a computational psychologist and uh, quite a few years ago now I um, was looking at whether you can predict people's individual intimate traits uh, from their digital footprints, such as Facebook likes. And in my research I would show that, in fact, you can very accurately reveal intimate traits of millions of people um, just looking at their Facebook likes, or status updates and so on. And it seems that the same methodology that I uh, was describing a few years ago uh, was being used in last election and particularly by uh, both Hillary Clinton actually and Donald Trump. Uh, and it seems that uh, uh, many people believe that uh, maybe use of this technology helped Donald Trump to uh, become elected. Um, Leah just described the article and um, the article said that, that there was this morning when, when Donald Trump uh, had been elected and you kind of woke up, saw everything on TV and, and thought, oh my God, they, they took my, my research method and turned it into a political strategy that will change the world. Was it like that? Well, I perhaps wasn't really so surprised that the technology has been um, used by politicians. I, four years ago, actually, or five years ago now, I've been writing this article saying that, look, there are plenty of advantages. You can use this technology for to benefit the humanity in big ways, but also you can use it to manipulate people and, uh, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, make them do things that they wouldn't otherwise uh, do. And I knew that politicians were using those methods, and then obviously when I woke up uh, in Zurich, uh, uh, on the day of the election of Donald Trump, it wasn't a particularly uh, cheerful day for me and uh, perhaps I kind of uh, um, really thought about the consequences that uh, those new technologies are bringing to our world. So you mentioned that you wrote about it four years ago already in 2013. Michael actually wrote a paper that ended up being the fourth most cited scientific article ever. Congratulations. Und jetzt vielleicht kurze deutsche Zusammenfassung. Michael ist also Psychologe und Datenwissenschaftler und hat sich schon vor einigen Jahren damit beschäftigt, inwiefern unsere digitalen Spuren, also unsere Aktivitäten, die Likes auf Facebook, die Interaktionen, all das, was wir auf Facebook machen, er hat sich auf Facebook erstmal konzentriert, wie diese Spuren eventuell voraussagen können, was für persönliche Eigenschaften wir haben. Und zwar auch relativ intime, sensible Daten und Informationen. Und genau das hat er eben vor vier Jahren schon mal beschrieben in einem Paper und hat da Damals schon gesagt, Vorsicht, da gibt es Manipulationsmöglichkeiten. Auch deswegen wurde damals schon viel über das Paper, diesen äh, wissenschaftlichen Artikel gesprochen und genau das ist dann passiert. Er sagte gerade, er ist also äh, an einem Morgen in Zürich, glaube ich, sogar aufgewacht am, am Tag der Wahl von Donald Trump und hat gedacht, ach du meine Güte. Er hat aber auch gesagt, dass diese Methode nicht nur von der Trump-Kampagne, sondern auch von Hillary Clinton genutzt wurde. What exactly is your method? Try to explain the, the ocean model. So the ocean model is a psychological profiling model. How did you connect it with data? Well, it's not really my method. It's uh, it's just uh, it's just the property of the big data that now you can basically use algorithms to uh, reveal intimate traits, including psychological traits such as personality, intelligence, political views, uh, whether you like Trump or Hillary Clinton, what music you're listening to, a number of other things can be revealed from data that uh, is seemingly innocent, like just the history of your geographical location, or maybe what you write, uh, and what you write in your emails, or what you like. And now, 
what many people don't really see intuitively is that you may have never mentioned your political views on Facebook, you may have never written to your friends about uh, what your uh, personality is, and yet a computer algorithm would be able to uh, reveal, detect this information uh, based on signal as simple as Facebook likes. And now people talk about ocean model. Ocean is just a particular uh, type of uh, model that we use in personality psychology to describe differences between people. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether you use ocean or you use MBTI or maybe some other psychological model or even if you're using psychological model at all. Because when you're using the algorithms to predict future behavior, you don't essentially even need to um, be revealing any particular traits. You can just be asking the computer, hey, can you tell me, can you tell me which of the voters are likely to be swayed or which of the voters are, uh, can be potentially convinced to believe in this thing that is not uh, true and the model will provide you with a prediction of this. In my article I, I, I read um, that a certain number of, of Facebook lives being analyzed the way you just described uh, leads to the fact that uh, a person analyzing those Facebook lives knows somebody using 115 Facebook lives knows somebody better than his or her parents uh, know the, the person or taking 300 Facebook lives likes um, analyzing them um, uh, the person doing this knows the other one better than the partner of that very person. That I find scary. Well, it's scary, but it's also great that, uh, you know, people tend to judge each other just based on some kind of surface uh, issues. We don't really spend so much time to think about the others, and when we do, we also put people in those little buckets. We use stereotypes to reduce people to labels, like newlywed couple that likes hiking, or a workaholic man that uh, drives fast cars, or whatever. And then you kind of have this kind of slap this label on people and then you kind of extrapolate from it and you reduce a person with few words. Now, what algorithms can do, they can represent a person in an arguably way more robust way. It can, uh, uh, they can compare you with millions of other people and instead of reducing you to few numbers, like five numbers of the ocean model, or reducing you to a stereotype like a newly wet couple that likes hiking, it can describe you as 5,000 numbers, 10,000 numbers, which is arguably way more, um, uh, way more robust way of describing a human than whatever we can actually achieve as, as humans ourselves. In the newlywed couple that likes hiking um, in the Grand Canyon uh, near uh, Phoenix and uh, wears the scarper shoes and the certain trousers and um, <laughs> prefers the rucksack from the brand X or uh, I know a few of them. Just, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's what we know. So I'm, I'm not, not quite convinced that this is really de-stereotyping people, but um, I'm, I understand, I get your point. Quick summary. Miriam hat gerade angesprochen, dass äh, die Forschung von Michael äh, auch gezeigt hat, dass mit unter 150 Datenpunkte auf Facebook schon ausreichen, um eine Vorhersage zu kreieren, die angeblich robuster ist oder auf jeden Fall akkurater, was persönliche Eigenschaften angeht, als die eigenen Eltern es über eine Person wohl anstellen könnten. Bei 300 Likes oder Aktivitäten oder Interaktionen ist es dann schon so akkurat und robust und detailliert wie der eigene Partner. Das ist natürlich ganz schön heftig, aber Michael sagte sofort, das kann ja auch positiv sein, weil wir als Menschen ja auch sehr viel kategorisieren. Wir denken eigentlich auch in so ähm, Silos bzw. So, so Buckets, also Eimern, wo man gleich nach fünf Punkten, die man über jemanden hat, meint, diese Person zu kennen. Und er sagt, ein Algorithmus kann natürlich viel mehr Datenpunkte kombinieren, einbauen etc. Und deswegen ist es nicht nur äh, negativ. But what are the methods of manipulation? So actually my question is, what did the political campaigns do with that? So now they know people really well. Where's the problem? What did they end up doing? Well, by knowing someone's intimate traits, and this is pretty intuitive, if you know someone very well, yeah. you, it will be easier for you to convince them to do certain things, or you can decide that they're too stubborn to even waste your time, mm -hmm. and which is actually also great from the point of view of a marketer, for instance, mm -hmm. if they know that a given person wouldn't be convinced anyway. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, if algorithms know someone pretty well, the algorithms or the operators of the algorithms can uh, now try to convince, influence those people. And now what you can think again of many positive applications. Convincing people to stop smoking or to start eating healthily mm -hmm. is something that we would all agree uh, is something we should all 
that uh, be hopeful for. So what you're talking about is, is totally understandable that, that it's a new method of, of really diving into consumers, into voter groups and, and all those kinds of things. What uh, the company using the method and, and having claimed to have used it for the Brexit uh, campaign as well as for the, mm -hmm. for the Trump uh, election campaign is Cambridge Analytica. Um, I found it very interesting how they um, came up very upfront with uh, we uh, decided the American elections by using that model on the Trump campaign. Is that true? Well, if you're a company that wants to sell its services, of course you say that you decided uh, the election. What do you think? I what think that, look, it's a bit like TV, right? Both sides of the campaign use TV. Both sides of the campaign use data analytics to target their advertising. So it's a necessary part of the election, uh, of running the campaign. It's like running radio ads and TV ads and newspaper ads. But it's not something that gives you a competitive edge because both sides of the campaign are using it. And in fact, the moment you started targeting the messages to individuals, so you know, in the past, marketers, including political marketers, they would just have one message, yes we can, and send it to everyone out there, just throwing a lot of money on radio, TV and whatnot. Today, that you can personalize message to individuals, what happens is that instead of having these common slogans that kind of are intended to satisfy an average person, which is nobody, you can actually now talk to a person that is interested in a given thing about this given thing. So to keep keeping the message relevant and interesting, dragging people into the political uh, process, making them more engaged, which arguably is great for, for, for the politics and democracy. And also because now you can reach people so cheaply and reach them with different messages, not only the importance of the actual message increases, but also the price of entering the political race drops. And we, could see it, uh, we did see it in the uh, US campaign where you had both outsiders, Donald Trump and uh, Bernie Sanders, who did not have much in terms of uh, experience and uh, funds and support from the establishment, and they managed to basically become really successful in this political process. One of them became president, the other one nearly got uh, nomination over a politician with such a huge support and such Hillary Clinton with such a great machine uh, kind of promoting her. So arguably this is again great for democracy that we can decrease the role of money and increase the role of message mm -hmm. in politics. But is it really new? Because a lot of people are, at least to me, you know, especially in response to the article, a lot of people said, I thought that's exactly why Barack Obama won in 08. What is new about uh, using, you know, analytics uh, just to, you know, be provocative? Is that really so new? Or would you say, we've actually been doing it for years, we're trying to perfect it? Is it new? Exactly what she said. Okay. We were using it for years. It's getting okay. better. Yeah. And you know, with new media like, let's say, Facebook or Twitter, yeah. I think we're taking it to a very different uh, level as well. And also people, now in the past, a small fraction of people were on digital media. Now nearly everyone has Facebook or Twitter or other access to social media. So the importance of this channel of communication is way larger than four, uh, eight years ago for sure, but even four years ago. So, um, last point, um, what are, what's your assumption on the French elections? Who's going to be winning on, on Sunday? Well, let's uh, not make those assumptions because even if I'm optimistic and I, uh, and I think that we will have, we'll have uh, liberal and democratic forces uh, winning this time, I think that uh, actually in a way saying that may discourage some people from going to vote. So my message to, to French people would be uh, just don't trust that others will go and vote in your name, just go and vote yourself. That's what I find very interesting. Yes. So that means you're not allowed to express your opinion any longer because it might be influential in turning those parties uh, against you that might, be, might have been inclined to vote for somebody like, in this case, Emmanuel Macron, and then suddenly decide to do differently? Ooh. Oh, I was rather thinking about uh, people when they become convinced that their side is going to win, okay. they may lose motivation ah, to go. Okay. And no, no, then I'm with you. Yeah. Then, and then we, have, you know, we have 50 people watching, so I hope yep. that uh, they all, if they're French, they all go and vote. Well, actually, we also, since this is interactive, 
And uh, I saw Maria just uh, said erschreckend, wie man von Social schon durchschaut wird. It's actually kind of horrifying how much social media allows other people to sort of, you know, see inside our lives. Maybe the very last question, what can we do about it? As an individual, do you use Facebook? Do you recommend people should no longer like anything? Hmm. How can we somehow, you know, preserve some sort of privacy? Is it possible? Well, I would basically encourage everyone to use as much Facebook and other social media as they please. Mm -hmm. I use it a lot myself and I think it's a great tool to stay in touch and talk to people all around the world, so I think it's great. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not happy about it, but I'm convinced that uh, we will not have privacy in the future. It's not something that I'm happy about again. But the sooner we realize that we're not going to have privacy in the future, that algorithms are getting better at revealing our intimate traits, hackers are getting better at hacking into our communication channels, quantum computing will uh, end the encryption uh, abilities of individuals like us. Um, and we also, even if we're given full control over our data, mm -hmm. Look what happens. I still want my blog to be public. I still want the picture of my face to be out there. I still want my website, my Twitter channel to be open, which means that it's already enough data for a good algorithm to reveal all of my intimate traits. So basically going forward, there's going to be no privacy whatsoever. And the sooner we accept that fact, the sooner we can actually sit down and start thinking about how to make sure that this post-privacy world is a safe uh, and habitable place. And just one last point that, you know, we talk in our bubble here, Facebook bubble, Western bubble, bubble. Mm -hmm. we talk about, you know, how uh, lack of privacy will bring us maybe some creepy marketing or maybe some uh, unpleasant exposure to news that you wanted or didn't want to watch. But we have to realize that in other countries there are less liberal and less open-minded. Lack of privacy can actually result in you know life and death situation. Think about Definitely. the countries where homosexuality is illegal. Yeah. Uh, their lack of privacy can basically get you killed. Yeah, right. Gisela is saying the point is being aware of these methods. That's right. You yeah. made us all aware, certainly in the article, but also today. We should have one more stream at some point talking just about the lack of privacy in the future. Definitely. And uh, first of all, thank you very much, Michael. Yes. Thank thank you. You. The funny thing is that we're going to be having a panel um, at, uh, in, in a in few minutes now. Um, uh, wir werden noch ein Panel dazu machen hier am St. Gallen Student Congress um, und über dieses Thema reden mit uh, Michael Kuczynski und äh, haben jetzt sozusagen schon mal die Sneak Preview hier äh, in unserem Livestream gemacht und ja, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, die Sonne ist wunderbar hier, die Stimmung ist gut. Wir zeigen nochmal so einmal so ein bisschen hier, was hier so alles los ist, dass man nochmal so ein Gefühl kriegt, wo wir <lacht> unterwegs sind hier und äh, wie man sich auch einen schönen Kongress vorstellen kann. So, und damit äh, war das unser zweiter Livestream und wir sind... Wir sehen uns wahrscheinlich am Dienstag von der Republika aus, äh, aus genau. Berlin. Da sind Miriam und ich in Berlin und Miriam hält ein Vortrag auf der Republika und wir werden nachmittags wieder streamen. Genau, und zeigen, was da so abgeht und was die Themen des Tages sind. Also, schönes Wochenende. Tschüss. Bye, Michael. Thank you. Bye, Michael. Tschüss.